I'd like to welcome back to the show, returning champion, Richard Height. How are you doing, Richard? Thank you, Alex. Nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, you're one of the few, you're actually the second return guest I've had. Uh, because the show is, is a young show starting out, but, uh, apparently we had such a good time that you said, Hey, can I come back on to talk about my new book? I was like, absolutely. I mean, last, if, if anyone, if anyone cares to listen to our last episode, uh, we did finish off with the concept that the roadrunner and the coyote, uh, is a great analogy for a, a great Yogi, which is the roadrunner and the coyote who is obviously stuck in the material world. <laughs> That's right. It's a material girl. Exactly. I think we should we should jointly write a book about how the, the complete philosophies of the Roadrunner and, and the well, Warner Brothers, right? Oh my God, that would be amazing. Oh. Yeah. So you have a new book. It's called The Genesis Code. Can you what well, first best question is what is the Genesis Code? So um now just before I get started, how much time do we have today to talk about this? Uh, I am open, so we're good. I mean, if you All want to talk right. for an hour, hour and a half, a couple hours, I already went to the bathroom. All right. Good. Good to know before I go too deep into the weeds on this one. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, the Genesis Code actually started many years ago. Um, I, was, I was eight years old. I had a dream uh, of Jesus coming to me and asking me to find his teachings and bring them back to the world having no clue what that meant. Um, it sort of initiated this search for um, what that truth may be. And I spent many years going through the Bible. I just I went to church and um, I, I just found that uh, there was, it was just so confusing, so utterly confusing. It's, there's so much inconsistency. And so I couldn't find what this thing was. And I really did know deep within me, I'm going to have to find this in my own life. I mean, if I was being really honest, that, that, that's what I would, would have had to have said to myself. But, you know, kids, we want to get the answer, the easy answer. Um, and so I just started this process of, of what we will call spiritual awakening that has taken since I was eight and, and, and up to this point now. At some point, I did understand a, a fundamental principle that when a human being abides by this principle, it's, it's liberating in ways that, that are, are deeper than what psychology could be liberating or, or even really, um, I don't mean that you can walk on water, but, but, but it's, you're free of the suffering of the egoic self in, in a profound way. And you understand exactly why you're free of it. And you understand exactly what you do that binds you up in it, that gets you caught up in it. I wrote many, many books on awakening. And at some point, uh, I don't remember when it was, maybe last year, I, I, I just had a vision. In, in the middle of the night, I, I had a vision. And later when I got out of bed to check it, because the vision was of the Bible. It was a vision of, well, I, what I saw in the vision was, the Bible flipping backwards from the end, which would be Revelations, you know, all the way to the beginning, which is Genesis. Now, I've never been a fan of Genesis. I didn't like it. Uh, it just seemed, I, I didn't understand it. It seemed very different from, or like out of sync with, with for example, what we think would think of as Christianity. And I'm not even Christian, but 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 it just I did, didn't understand it. And I, I think I think it made me feel that God was, you know, actually not a very kind person. Right. Right. Because, because he, he kicks Adam and Eve out of Eden or heaven yeah. um, for what seems like a pretty trivial thing. I mean, they're just kids. <laughs> exactly. Imagine if, if our kids because like, don't, they don't eat the chocolate their bar. Fathers were out, don't right? eat the chocolate bar. And yeah. all of a sudden, like you're out of the house. Like that right. seems pretty extreme. That's right. <laughs> Forever. You're for, gone. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so, and, and specifically saying, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to make you suffer in, in, in just about every way possible. Right. Yeah. It sounded like a pretty horrific thing, considering this would be an all-knowing God that would have known in the, during the creation of the re universe and Adam and Eve, would have known that they would, were going to make this choice. And he specifically put that tree in the center of the garden and made it look really edible and tasty. Of course. 
And then, and then there was a snake the temptation involved. temptation was just overwhelming, right? Is it, there was a snake involved. There was a pressure, peer involved. pressure. It was like a That's thing. A peer pressure. They're a very clever <laughs> snake, cleverer than all the animals in the garden, right? Obviously. <laughs> uh, and so I had a strong bias against it. But in this, in this mystical state that I'd entered into in the middle of the night, I could see the text of Genesis 1, specifically chapters 1 through 3, which is the creation story. And, and I could see, like, text was highlighted. Specific lines were highlighted that, was, that I understood were encoded. And I understood what that coding meant. And so when the vision was over, I got out of bed, went, to my, went into my office and my workspace, got my Bibles, and, and started reading through Genesis 1 through 3 to see, is this just a brain fart? Or, or does this actually work out? with the actual text and turns out it works out with the actual text. It didn't matter which Bible I used or which version, the same basic pattern is there. The same basic, we'll, we'll almost the layers of perception are there. And so that code is embedded in there. And, and that's really where it began. And once I, once I saw that code, then I, I understood I needed to write this book. And that's when, when, um, when the project really took off. Now, um, I know this is a very loaded question. What did you see in the code? Is that basically the entire conversation of the book? Or is there certain things it, that you well, were the, able to see? The, thing, the, the book is interesting in that it's, it's very different from other books. What the book is doing, when I saw the code and I understood what it meant, I also understood that this was the truth that set you free that Jesus is described as saying. You know, there was a truth that set you free that he never ex- explicated on, Right. And so I, 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 I understood the nature of this code and, and the principle that it, that, it, that it conveys. But I also understood that for a person to really get it, they have to develop a certain inner awareness. Almost they have to develop the eyes to see because our brains are so confused with our biases, so confused with our belief systems that it prevents us from seeing things that are really obvious. I mean, we can see this in the world right now. There are so many things going on that people are in denial of. So we know this is an actual fact. It's just that most people don't want to admit that about themselves, right? There's an old saying, it's easier to fool someone than to, than to show them that they've been fooled. Mm-hmm. That's right? very true. It's very, very true. And that's true of all of us. And so when I saw the Genesis code, did a co- when I saw the principle, it did a couple of things for me. One is it, really like high definition made it very clear all the subtle little ways that I was going to miss in, in, in application of mind and consciousness in behaviors and whatnot. And I don't mean this in a moral sense because this is not, the teaching is not a moral teaching. The principle is not a moral principle. It is a principle of mind and consciousness that is, that applies by the way we direct our attention. And so the book is, it, it, it unravels this whole process and shows how the code lays out because within Genesis, there's not just the code. That's the thing that, I'll, that nobody seems to see. I know I certainly didn't see it. Never heard anybody ever talk about it, read a book about it, but it's, it's sort of religious teaching, ethical teaching, um, moral teaching, you know, that the Bible's about those kind of things, as well as maybe some historical things, a lot of mythology and, and that sort of thing. But there's an, another layer underneath of it. And the code, in order for it to truly function, requires that an individual do two things. One is they soften their sense of individual, uh, of the individual ego, like mm. open it up so that you, you, you more and more feel your connectedness to your environment, to to reality. We know this in physics. The, the entire universe is a giant field of energy. This is what Einstein was saying. This is what quantum physics says. It's, it's one giant field of energy that, it, that layers many different, almost like a rainbow, many different layers of frequencies of that energy that, that are matter. Energy and matter is interchangeable. So we know it's all unified. Yet we perceive ourselves as being somehow separate. Like I'm talking to somebody else who's separate from me. We don't have a shared, like, yes, we understand we have some shared experience. We, we get up in the morning, we, we, we go to the toilet. We, but, but I don't feel like, I don't mean I, but we typically don't recognize 
that the same thing that's looking out your eyes, the thing that's looking out your eyes is exactly the same thing that's looking out my eyes. But through a different filter. Through a different set of filters. So it's really interesting. It's really interesting because, you know, I was, I was talking to a, 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 new, a newer surgeon the other day, uh, as, as one does. And, 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 it was, and it was really interesting. He was coming up with the concept in regards to um, oneness and all of us being connected as, as, as being connected. And he took, took a scientific approach. He's like, it's the equivalent of an electron or an atom saying, I'm the only atom that really matters. It's all, I only care about that. If the other atoms don't work together, we don't have a body. We don't have existence. We don't have the material, the material reality that we have. It is the, the cooperation of us all, this oneness that we have lost. We've lost along the way. We've disconnected from ourselves because of the ego, the ego separates us because that's the job of the ego. And we have to kind of break yes. through that. Is that a fair, uh, fair assumption? Yeah, the ego is a survival tool. Absolutely, it is an illusion in a sense that 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 aids the body to uh, to survive. And so the the electron, I think the electron idea is great, or a photon, or anything like that. Any of those. Yeah. There's no there's no distinction between this electron and that electron. Right. They're all identical. There's no differentiating quality or um, aspect of one. There's an electron A versus electron B. They're all identical. In the same way that electrons are identical in different atoms or free flowing electrons, like in, you know, right, whatever that would be, um, elect what we call electricity, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, human beings are exactly the same. And when you, when you, they're lay, we have layers of, we'll say layers of mind, layers of identity, layers of uh, psychic qualities. I don't mean psychic in a mystical sense, I mean like of the psyche. Mm -hmm. And when we get deep enough in uh, through, could, could happen through meditation, could happen through some mystic, naturally occurring mystical experience. You know, you're walking along the beach and suddenly poof, you, you, <laughs> just something opens up and you feel totally one and connected and the individual identity of you is just gone. Could happen through psychedelics. There's lots of ways that this can happen. I, mean, I suppose it could happen as a result of getting hit in the head in the right place. Who knows, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You never know when it will happen or in, in what way it will happen. But it is possible to get down to this layer of, well, foundation, what I would say, of pure perception that is not about the identity, that, that's even deeper than the organism's survival mechanisms. And that layer, or that, it's not a layer, that, that foundation is identical in everyone. But that foundation is what's looking at your eyes. That's what's experiencing. It's really interesting. It's really better that seem to be individual. Yeah, it's really interesting because I feel that so much. Like you know, you and I are both obviously heavy meditators. You wrote a whole book, multiple books on meditation, and and I, I'm a heavy meditator as well. I find that when you're meditating and you fall into that really sweet spot where time doesn't exist anymore where you aren't even aware that you're in meditation anymore. You're, you're almost gone in this kind of place. There is, when you're in that place, the ego is gone. There is no ego in that place. You are reconnecting, I feel, so many times to the source. And I think you can get through that through psychedelics. Like you said, med deep meditators are able to do that. Sometimes it's very blissful. I know in my meditations, I get it almost a blissful feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, and many times when we, not many times, every time we go to sleep, there is no ego in sleep. We are disconnected from the material world. And then we come back to it every, every morning. It's, well, it's like I'm a reconnection. Sure there's no ego when you sleep because you do take on identity in your dream. It's just a flexible ego. It's, was, it's a different, it's a different I'm definition. Richard or Alex, and it may, you may be somebody else. Right. No, but very often in dreams, you are you and you are experiencing it. So yeah, there is that ego, but I'm not talking about, I think that's more of an identity than it is ego because it's not the sense of ego. Like I am the best or my ego is being hurt or things like that. Ah, so I'm actually going by what I would say is the scientific definition of ego, not the kind of lay person's usage of it. 
I mean ego in the sense of a sense of an individual identity. So that would be the definition of ego, correct? The science, the more scientific navigates between what we call the id, which is your body's like primary drives to breed and get food and you know survive, fun stuff, (laughs) (laughs) which is society's influence, right? Right. So I'm I'm looking at it from a scientific perspective. From that scientific perspective, the, I'm I'm referring to the ego in the dream in the dream state, but in the meditation state, I don't. I I found it not to be there. Yes, my, my personal that's experience. right. That's right. And and I imagine there. I mean, I've had plenty of dreams, uh, dream dream states or sleep states where the ego wasn't there. Of course. Yeah. Um, and so it can be there or not be there, but and it can also be there during meditative states. But as you notice, when you get to that sweet spot, which not everybody gets to. Correct. Took um, me years. <laughs> it can take, it can take a long time to get there where it's just, we're just, we are the moment. We are clear. There's no time. It's, right? it's, it's amazing. I love, I love the moments where I, I fall into a, a meditation. And then when I come back out of it, I have no idea how much, I don't even know what time it is. Yes. I've, I've lost all track of time. I've lost all track of space. And that is a moment of I always find it a moment of reconnection because I feel invigorated. I feel alive. Uh, many times I feel blissful. Like I'll walk out, I'll walk out of my, my office and I'll just be like in this high. It's a really bizarre thing. And I've gotten used to it over the years, but almost high, like you're just like so happy. It's almost like you went and touched, touched the other side for a second and then came back and like, okay, but you do it in a very control as opposed to a near death experience. It's a kind of, it's kind of something similar. It, and that's why I can understand. It, it is in a sense, I think it's very similar to a near death experience in that the ego has, has, uh, has been checked or is gone. Yeah. It's like right. the, there's a door you pass and yes. the ego has to stay there. Like it, the, the security it guard won't let, won't let them into the party. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And there's something you said about that, that there's a vibrancy to that experience when you're coming out of it and you're in, entering back into the normal perception, something is with you during that. It, it's as if everything is like your computer. You've refreshed your browser on the computer. Yes. It's like that. You're seeing everything fresh and anew as it is, not just as your memory projects it to be. Right. Or at least a much greater percentage of as it is than and less of how you can make use of it. So it feels fresh and new and open. And it's not that you don't have memory of, you look at that person, you know their name, but it's just that that memory isn't the primary um, filter through which the perception is being experienced. Right, exactly. And it seems like uh, like the, a lot of the master yogis and things, they're able to get to meditation into that that sweet spot that takes us a minute to get to sometimes. They're able to get jump in and jump out whenever they want, and they can go so much farther and deeper than we could. And you can see it. You can, there's almost a, vi- a, a, a vibrance to their just being in the room with them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, now, in the book, you talk about the face of God. Can you explain what that means? I'm referring to the face of God. I believe um, early on in, uh, in in it's sort of a an affectionate term for a mystical experience that I had where I realized that the nature of the universe, uh, at least in, I'm, I'm going to describe the experience. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't know anything about physics. I mean, everybody knows a little bit about physics, but I'm not an expert in physics. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm discussing, or I'm, I'm going to describe this as I experienced it. And then what I called it. And so I saw the, the universe as, essentially the shape of a torus. And for those who are not familiar with it, imagine a donut with a hole in it. That's a torus. Uh, that's a ring shape. But, but basically, what you've, there's this flow that's doing this. Now, the Earth has an energy flow just like that. Magnetic fields. Yeah. Galaxies, you know, you know the, the whole thing has this type of flow, which at the time I didn't realize. Um, and, uh, but, but the entire thing I realized was conscious. Every atom, every cell, every electron, everything within it is conscious. The, the important point about what I describe as the face of God is that we have to differentiate. It's helpful to differentiate consciousness from like IQ or intelligence. We tend to think of consciousness as being like IQ or intelligence or ego. Right. But that's a really limited, and as long as we hold 
um, consciousness to that kind of definition, we are going to be blind to something that may be much more fundamental and deeper. So I'm describing consciousness as simply the apprehensive capacity, per perception itself, the very capacity to perceive. And I don't necessarily mean through the eyes, although we do perceive through the eyes, uh, that level of perception goes much, much deeper than the physical senses we think of. And that first sense is just the recognition I perceive. The, wa the watcher, that concept of the, the watcher. watcher right? right. And that that process of the recognition I perceive is happening at a universal level. And it is, in fact, what, what leads to what we describe as the Big Bang or the escalation that we describe as the universe. It's a search of consciousness to define itself, to understand itself. It's an exploration that would include all potentials, all possibilities that balance out in a positive and negative form. What that means, but what I mean by that is, so I'm trying not to get too esoteric here, mm -hmm. but what I mean by positive and negative form is that conscious, consciousness itself is a, what, a, what I describe as a conscious zero. It has no actual substance besides the function of perception. Mm -hmm. But once it in the, once you recognize, you know, I'm putting it in time, but there's very difficult to talk about. This is a timeless state. Yes, obviously. <laughs> yeah, the, this is not, a, these are not easy questions. <laughs> yes. We'll say this is center to foundational prior to however you mm -hmm. want to think what we think of as physical existence. That statement's alive because physical existence, whatever we think of as existence, actually in a, in a certain way has always been. Might not have been this universe, but but this process is all is a timeless process, actually. Well, I mean, the concept of time in general is is based around revolutions of a planet around the sun. That's how we measure yes, time. That's right. Uh, okay. In this existence, so yes. if we were in another existence, or if we were on Jupiter, time would be different. Time if I was, sense, time would be different. Yes. Uh, if I was a dog one year would be seven years. Yeah. You know, if I was, a, if I was a, a fruit fly, a day is a lifetime. It's all about perception of time. That's why there are those moments where, you know, this as a, an athlete as well, you get into the flow state, that mm -hmm. state that time stands still. Like you've just don't even have any recognition. We talked about that in meditation mm -hmm. as well, but getting into that, um, into that understanding of time, when you start realizing that it, it's, you know, of course, consciousness is no place in time. Consciousness is just what it it's, is. Yeah, it's 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 prior to uh, what we would think of as time, which or, is hard. Uh, which is hard to conceive of in this in this reality, in this in this yes, reality that this material just, reality. Not really good at this. <laughs> the, the, the ego is like, wait, what, what do you mean? There's no beginning and there's no end. What do you mean? It's always yes. been. Everything has to have a beginning. Everything has to have an end. That's just the way the world works. Yes. There is duality. There's good. There's bad. There's yes. black and white. That's, that's all right. ego. That's all ego. That's right to a degree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. right. Depending on which lens you're looking through. Now, if you're looking through the lens of the ego, all that seems to make sense until something happens where you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, there's, it's possible to look through a different lens and realize that through that lens, all that time stuff isn't exactly fully true. Correct. It's helpful, it's helpful to allow the organism to continue its experience or story of life, right? But, but, but that's not all there is. And there's actually something, a perception that's much deeper than that. And so, so if it's all right to get back to the positive sure. and negative. So let's imagine, let's imagine there's no time, no space. There's just suddenly in the midst of nothingness, there's the awareness I am. We'll use that. That's a common like, sure. um, description of truth as I am or God as I am and all that kind of stuff. We'll say that. Okay. So that's the fundamental thing is the recognition I perceive, right? So if there's a record, if we say I am, the very fact that we say, think, feel that means that we already have an innate understanding of, of its opposite. It's it, I am notness. You cannot make a statement or have the thought or a feeling of I amness without having something to judge it by or compare it to, which means you also intuit a I am notness. We now have the idea of being, and we also have the idea of not being whether they're both um, at the forefront of attention or not is irrelevant. 
one being conscious, one being unconscious. That's all it's, but both forces are there. We have a positive and a negative that balance out to zero. And the exploration of consciousness as it explores its possibilities of being always creates, a, always results in or is a positive and negative juxtaposition. So no matter how complex the system is, it will always sum out to zero. So if we look at protons and electrons, a positive and negative force, and people have been wondering the mass of the universe and, and, and the weight of the universe or the charge of the universe for years. What we know, what we know so far is the charge of the universe, or at least that's what it seems, is zero because the positive forces and the negative forces, protons and electrons, balance out to zero. Right. And with quantum physics and, and getting into that field, so much has been revealed to us, which has been talked about for thousands of years in some, in some yes. cultures and in regards to, you know, when they went all the way down to as far deep into an atom as they can get, they discovered there was space. Yes. So there, are, there is no solid state, which is yes. so difficult for the ego and for the mind to There's fields of energy. It's energy. It's all fields of energy. And it's, we don't even know what energy is. You know, it, it, it can never be created nor destroyed, all this kind of stuff, but you just- There's nothing to compare it to. So, there's, so, there's, so, there's so fascinating because there's so much that you know, we as, as humanity have figured out. They're like, oh, this is the way it is. And that's, and that's been that way since the beginning of recorded time from, yeah. from, from around the campfire- when they were, you know, when they were still clubbing, <laughs> clubbing animals and, and, and running from tigers, they were like, you know what? I know I got this whole thing figured out. I got that's, this whole thing. Right. I, I've yet to meet a person, this includes me, who thinks when they have an idea that they, they really like, who thinks it's wrong. Of course, because the ego won't allow that. The ego the can't won't allow that. We assume we're right and not everybody can be right. And the, the chances are pretty high that most of us are wrong. And the chances that any one of our ideas is correct is also pretty sketchy. And so, th which is why it's very helpful for an individual who actually wants to awaken in this way to like the foundation of their being or the fountain of their existence um, and be free of, I don't like to call it an illusion because it's, it's demeaning and, and kind of rude mm -hmm. because it's, the ego is a, an essential thing. Oh, without, without it, they're, they're, the ego provides a service. It helps to protect Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You know, it, it, there's, there's, you know, there's, you wouldn't get up on stage and speak in front of a thousand people or 10,000 people or anything without an ego to say, you can do that. You might do, some people might be delusional in that sense. Other sure. people might not be, but the ego allows that, you know, that example, but also protects you from the, from the tiger around the corner that was going to eat you, these kind of things. The ego does have a place. It's that when the ego runs rampant, which is where basically everybody's ego runs rampant, some more than others. Trust me, I've been in the film industry for almost 30 years. I've met a couple uh, <laughs> that, sure. that you just like, when anyone says, do you not know who I am? Oh, wow. You are so gone. <laughs> you are, yeah. you are yeah. off the reservation. When you say yeah. that to somebody, your yeah. ego is completely out of control. And I see, I see now, I think what's going on in the world. Like, I think you, we mentioned it a little bit. There's so much discourse in the world right now. There's so much upheaval on every aspect, whether it be political, whether it be countries, uh, whether it be environmental, um, the pandemic, the everything that's going on, never in our not in our lifetime for sure. Uh, but I can't even remember a time where the entire world was going through something at the exact same time. Every, yes. The entire world is going through it. Not a section, not a country, not a, a group of countries. The entire world's going through this at the same time. And this kind I, of- I call this the three pillars of collapse. So yeah, please explain that. So in 2009, I had a vision in the, I was in the Amazon. I had a vision there of what was the, the near future to come our societies worldwide would go through what, what I call the three pillars of collapse or what that vision showed is the three pillars of collapse, which is economic, ecologic, and societal. <laughs> We're getting close. And it would all happen at the same time. Yeah. And the key point is that in all of these levels, at all the layers of our societies, uh, corruption has taken over. And so people are not sufficiently wedded to, to the truth or the desire to explore honestly. 
Instead, they're at a point where they're either taking it, milking the system. And we can see this in so many organizations worldwide where yeah. the leaders are all like 70, 80 years old. And just Why holding just on them? with, holding on with like. A- they, they're holding everybody back and doing everything they can, it seems, to keep their control over systems that they don't even understand. These people don't know how to use the Internet. They don't know our, our world anymore. They're disconnected. And, but, but they're enjoying their influence and whatnot. And I, and I don't want to judge them in a negative way. I'm just saying, because we, we might do the same thing if we were in that position. Of course. Right? Yes. But, but, but you, you could just have conversations with ordinary people who are more and more polarized. People are more and more, what do you say, um, into their party line. Mm-hmm. Or just within, they're just, they're falling into ego. They're falling into the yes. id, the id the of pinching. themselves. Yeah, they're they're bombing yeah. on to what they believe to be a truth because it makes them feel secure, oftentimes socially, because their friends believe this or whatnot. Sure. And again, I don't want to judge that morally because that's not the point. Of just, course that's not. just what's happening. It's clear. And very few of us are willing to say, maybe my perception is incorrect. It's tough to say that. It's really tough. Like, like you know, it's it's easier to tell someone that you've been fooled than that you have been fooled. It's easier to fool somebody than to tell them. That's exactly right. That You could replay that one a million times and it still works out. <laughs> That's it's, true. Yeah, because you don't want, your ego doesn't allow you. I'm like, I've, I haven't been taken. You've been taken. I haven't been taken. I haven't been fooled. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. And then so you start digging in more and more and more into whatever your belief is, regardless. It doesn't matter what side you're on. Right. It, both, both sides, all sides, has to happen. And then there's this thing called the pandemic that kind of has shaken up the entire world in a sense that uh, industries and places, uh, different industries, different companies, different things have been completely shaken up to a place where uh, that that hold, that power hold that you, that you were talking about is been completely, it's been thrown out of whack because Dependent. So now everybody wants to work at home now. That's right. The whole thing has changed. Things are starting right. like shifting. Right. You know, the way, th- the way things have been done has shifted completely. Mm-hmm. Right. Where now the way you and I are talking is completely acceptable to do business in this way now. That you this don't have to. The majority of businesses is done this way now, right? Right. Because before it would be like, no, you've got to, you got to drive over. You got to fly over. There was a lot of flights. There was a lot of this. You have to be in person. That has changed because of the pandemic. So there is there is definitely a change in the air. There's no question about it. And I, I feel like it's, I think the chaos that's happening, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Uh, if anything, I feel like it's amping up. If, as you just look at the news, things are starting to amp up more and more. It is the the de- the, the, the death rattle of the-, the Death uh, rattle, that's, that's a good description. It's a death rattle of the last- so, But it's also a revelation rattle. Correct. Because Correct. we're going through an apocalyptic phase. And, and I, 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 don't, I don't mean that exactly in like a religious sense. I mean it as, I the, term, mean. as the term is, defines itself or is defined, which means revelation through breakdown. Right. Right. First, you, it's like the ego is very, um, it's in a, it, it feels cornered. feels cornered. And it's not going to release for a lot of people until they lose everything. And they, and they go, shit, everything I really thought might not be true. But that's the first step. I call it the great unknowing. The first step to becoming aware of the essence of your nature or the fountain of life or whatever you want to call it, the essence of the universe is to, is to, to, to just like a cathartic, I fucking don't know. Like, <laughs> there's nothing I can look at that I believe to be true that viewed from every single possible angle will hold up. Yeah. That's yeah. the first thing. And that statement is true also for what I call the face of God or that primary consciousness. It doesn't know what it is. So if we were to call it God, people think God knows what God is. But what I'm seeing is that it doesn't know what it is. And there's a reason why it can't. And that's actually part of why the universe is the way it is. Why, when we get to that zero space, there is this sort of blissfulness. Um, or a feeling of connectedness. You, if you'll see in Genesis, it's not, it's not in Genesis. I can't remember actually where this quote is. It's in, it's in Exodus, if I recall, um, where, where Moses goes to Mount Sinai. 
and he converses with this burning bush and it turns out to be God. And then he asks that, that God tells him to go to the people and give them this in, certain information. And he asks, who, who should I tell them that sent me? And he says, I am that I am. Tell them I am that I am sent you. What does that mean, actually? I am that I am. It means I'm self-begetting. There isn't somebody before me. I wasn't the son of somebody. I exist that I exist. That's what it's saying. It's not giving any definition of its nature. Just that it doesn't know. It's saying, I know. The one thing I know is that I don't know where I come from because I don't come from anywhere. Which is so difficult for the mind and the ego to, to comprehend. Oh, the ego hates it. I mean, people are like, God knows where God is. Oh, no, no, no. That's what you think. Because you need you, you need something to hold on to. You need something to hold on to. Right. The concept but of there's... Yeah. The concept that right. I've always been, there's nothing to hold on to. Like you're, you're out there without a buoy to hold on to in an ocean. You need to, you know, the ego well, needs to put something there down. There is something to hold on to. That's the ego. <laughs> of course, the ego. You hold on to yourself. But there's uh, a price you pay for that. Now, in all fairness, I don't think the ego is wrong. And I don't think that people clinching is wrong either. I, I don't think they have a choice because I know what it was like when I was thrown in the pool and didn't know how to swim. You're overwhelmed. You're going to freak out. The ego is going to panic. Your body's going to go into a panic state. And that's where we're, we're in such a state of chaos. And essentially, we've, we've lived in, 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 in ways that seemed so certain for so long. We can't imagine that we might actually have to live hand to mouth. Yeah, it's 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 a strange it's a strange thing going on right now. I mean, I mean, you as an athlete would understand this as well. Is that in order to grow the muscle, it needs to be broken down. It needs to be broken down, and I think that is what's happening to us as a society, as a, as a species, as a human as humanity. We are being broken down in so many ways to a point where we're. That's the only way we can grow. You can't grow from a, of of a place of of strength. It's hard. You need to, even, even no matter how strong you are, right. you gotta, you gotta test the muscle. You gotta push the muscle. Right. If you talk to athletes in any sport, and I, I find it especially true in the more complex sports, mm -hmm. like, like for example, mixed martial arts is a great one yeah. uh, to, to exemplify this point. When you got someone who's just beastly, like they, they're a great puncher. I remember uh, Chuck Liddell, he just had this right oh. <laughs> overhand, right. That would just clean people's clocks. Mm -hmm. And so he, that was, that was his moneymaker and he relied on that and other skill areas were much weaker as a result. Yeah. And so athletes who could take advantage of his weak points took him apart. And so as we see the sport evolve more and more are the athletes becoming highly skilled in all of the areas because they understand that there are very few individuals whose moneymaker is strong enough now to overcome all of the varied skills that are out there. Yeah. If you have ground game, uh, and, but you, you can't punch you're you're weak. If, if your footwork's you, not good or whatever. Yeah. 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 Right. If you, if you're going to gas out, That's uh, right. you need to, you need more cardio in your life, That's you know, right. these, these cool. kind of, these kind of things. And it's kind of this well-roundedness, but, and I think, you know, using that analogy, I think spiritually, we all have to become a little bit more well-rounded um, and look yeah. at open up and look at things from completely different perspectives that might not be comfortable for yourselves. Sometimes you might have to be honest with yourself, which is extremely difficult for the ego. You know, it, look, I've have had to go through my own self awakening and my own self, you know, journeys and compl and, 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 and contem contem contemplations of my journey in life. And it's not easy. It's taken years and years and years to get to where, I mean, the, the, the guy who was 20 something, which we all know who you are at 20 something, um, generally speaking is nowhere near the person I am today, but mm -hmm. it's taken a lot of work and a lot of asking difficult questions and looking yourself in the mirror. And many people just don't want it. The ego, their egos don't want to look in the mirror. They want to hold on to what has been, what is comfortable, what is there. And they don't want to ask those tough questions of themselves and admit tough truths about that's themselves. Right. And I think that's also another reason why as a society right now, there is, there's a breakdown. Things are starting to break down around us, whether it's like the supply chain. I and mean, we just went to the supermarket last night and we're like, this is, this is serious. Like there's, 
There's holes in this. When was the last time pre-pandemic that you walked into a supermarket in America and it wasn't full <laughs> of right. obscene amounts of food? And I would, I would, I even said things to myself. I'm like, I would just walk down the frozen food aisle. I'm like, my God, this is one supermarket in one city. And there's thousands of cities around the country and there's tens of thousands of supermarkets and they all look like this. Yes. That's right. Such and now an such it's, an abundance. Oh my God. Such an abundance. And, and if yet you in that kind of a country where that's always been the case, you've never walked in and seen empty shelves. It's like, it's not even within your realm of imagination. Oh yeah. But I, I mean, you could imagine it in a fantasy land that will never be real, but you will not anticipate that tomorrow that there might not be food on the shelves. It is. And, and during the pandemic, it was really terrifying because everything really started to shut down. People hoarding toilet paper, as we all remember. And In the very beginning, yeah, the first so how many months, six months or something. Yeah. I mean, toilet paper was is more more expensive than gold. I mean, it was like it was insane. Priorities, you know, I mean, it was we all, bit, what we do understand, actually, is that the essence of ourself is our anus, because that's <laughs> That's what, what it really comes down to. Right. It really comes down to when the shit hits the fan, pardon the pun. Or the fit hits the shan, as I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> Toilet paper is our priority. <laughs> Who would have thought? Like when the world comes, thought. you know, when the apocalypse, when the apocalypse comes, you're like, wait a minute. I need to have a clean butt. I can't. I can't move forward without a clean butt. <laughs> it's just it was fascinating to see. And you're just like, I still remember calling up friends like, Dude, they got some toilet paper here. This one, they got like five left. You know, I can't buy anymore. You should get down here. Like it was, it was an, ins it's an insanity. And people think that that can't happen or it is happening right now. I mean, it really is happening. And there's certain things that things that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Things that we always thought and we always took for granted that we're going to be there are mm -hmm. not. That's right. And people feel it from, you know, poor kids who come out of college with two or $300,000 in debt and said, Hey, I got a degree. Where's my job. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, there's no job for you. Not that's going to pay this back. College university doesn't make a lot of sense these days. It, it, it depends. You know, now more and more, you know, Google and, and all these other big tech companies are like, we don't, we don't even require a four year degree. You have to show competence. Yeah. You just have to show. So it's like, so, so those, all these things that we were holding on to growing up, are starting to loosen and it's freaking a lot of people out yes. and it's starting and it's, and now you're starting to entrench yourself in beliefs that give you some sort of hold on your life that makes sense to you. So like, you know, if I believe this politically, I'm going to hold on to this politically. If I believe this, Blind. Blind. yeah, because it's the only thing you have left to hold on to when the rest of the world is starting to go down, you start back, the ego starts to back itself up into a corner and starts to like put up the, put up the walls, start putting the, the guns up and starting to like, I got to hold on to something because I, I, I can't go out there alone. And yes. that's what's happening to us uh, as a society and that's by right. countries. And the, you know, it's just so much. So it's, so it's pretty fascinating to watch what's going on and, and see it hopefully with a clear eye. And that's why I hope the show does is to give people different perspectives, because if you can't change your perspective, you, you can't grow, you can't move, right. you can't go forward in life. Here's the thing that's, it's, it's, it's beautiful and can be, it can be disconcerting when you recognize this. And so what I, what I will say now, I'm going to make a statement that, that is a model that's functional. All models break down at some point. So it's just a functional model to help people kind of get a sense of what's going on in a very short frame of time. Mm -hmm. The further you, you, the further your daily window of awareness, whatever you think of as your daily life intelligence and you is from the root of your being, the more unstable you are inside emotionally. Say that and again. Persistent say that. as well. The so further, say that again. The further that you are psychologically, I suppose we could say, and also I would say neurologically from the root of existence, that zero consciousness, mm -hmm. the more unstable you will feel in times like this. Of course. And that will express itself, whether you want it to or not, as moral judgment. Those people are fucking idiots. They're evil. Those lefties, those wing nuts, those, I mean, there's this scorn and, and it's just an animal backed into a corner. Right. 
But what it doesn't recognize, what the ego doesn't recognize is the corner that it's backed into is actually it's furthermost distance from the root of being. That's the corner. Right. There's this tremendous smallness inside as a result of going to the extreme of ego and its closeness. And so what people tend to think is, especially if we've, we've been exposed to Eastern thought and philosophy, is that we should kill the ego or the ego needs to die or the ego needs to disappear. That's actually not helpful. And that's never been the way. Right. It's that the ego opens like a flower. And it opens to a greater context. It opens to the universal connectedness of life. It, it can do that. My ego has done that. And it's a very different experience from the closed ego. This is why Buddha is sitting on an f- open flower. That's what that means, right? It's a hint that people just, you know, a lot of times people teach. The, I find this with my own students. I will teach things very, very clearly. But once you say a word, once you say a sentence, you're not in control of how people receive it. Exactly. Oh, God, yes. Right. And so then later on, maybe some months later, weeks later, I'm talking with that same student and they say, you know, you said this a couple of weeks ago and this means that. And I'm like, no, I didn't say that. Whatever you think I said, that's not what I said. Here's the video to prove it. <laughs> you know, here's the- but it's a filter, but it's a filter that we all have. It's so like that we all have, it's, it's just the way our ears, our perception are, again, it's all back to perception, our perspective, if you will, of what you're saying. So this, in this conversation to one person could be very enlightening to other one could be enraging enraging this could and or just plain stupid exactly uh, it could be it could be multiple yeah yeah but other other people can find it very enlightening very uh it, it can lead them down certain paths of thought it can make you ask questions so it all depends on the perspective of the person listening to the words and that is something and, and that what their I, actual motivation is correct exactly yeah because some people i mean who is it like I mean, well, there's, there's, there's so many things that some people take the wrong way and go off on a distance and, and like, well, obviously Jesus, Jesus's teachings in general, you know, I think it was Yogananda who said Jesus was uh, crucified on the cross in one day, but his teachings have been crucified for the last 3000 years. Yes. Been crucified. In fact, I'm in the process of, it seems like maybe writing a new book that's sort of about that. Currently it's uh, that it's, I have, I've actually pinpointed within the New Testament exactly where it went astray. The one thing that's there. Now, there are many subtle things, but there's one core principle, one core thing that they've missed that's been perverted, that has caused almost every form of misunderstanding. And I mean, let's be honest, a lot of judgmentality. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why Christianity is on the wane right now. It's because there's been a backlash over, for, for years and years of the finger-wagging phenomena. You're going to hell if you don't believe as I believe. And the sad thing is they will do it to each other. If you're not in my specific group, you're going to hell. If you go back, if you look at the original groups of, you know, like the writings of the, of, of the first generations of Christians after and Gnostics, Gnostics after Jesus's crucifixion, you will see a common phenomenon and it's that they're all calling each other antichrist. Right. If you're not, the Christ teaching is here. Anything that's different from this is a misteaching and therefore antichrist. This is just another form of moral judgment. You're calling them evil. Right. right. And, and that's not helpful because we all know what it's like when someone calls us, when someone labels us in a, in, in, in a denigrating way. What happens is there's this feeling of closing up. We're not probably going to want to talk with that person, or certainly we don't feel that they're having a genuine conversation with us. They're not seeing us. They've right. just given us this really simple label that allows us them to dismiss us. Right. Because that, that way the ego is extremely happy. They're like, okay, that's obviously that I'm person. Safe. I'm safe. I'm good. And yeah, I feel morally superior. Exactly. And there's nowhere in history, in the history of humanity, that anyone has has changed their mind from being called an idiot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. No, nobody ever has ever done that. So when you do that kind of thing, it is counterproductive to the scenario that you're trying to achieve, right. generally speaking. And in fact, if, if, if an individual actually is curious and wants to explore what I'm saying here with regard to these labels and denigrations and the judgment, moral judgments and all of that, all you have to do is pay attention to your own, the feeling in your body when you label somebody. Oh, yeah. You will know without a doubt, if you're paying attention, 
that in that moment, there's, this, there's you're getting a dopamine hit and you feel morally superior. So maybe this whole denigration stuff, if part of it is you just want to feel morally superior. You want to feel superior to other people. Mm-hmm. And right now in the world, there's an absolute, it's like a frenzy of moral superiority going on. And moral superiority is another sign of the extreme distance one is from psychologically from one's fountain of being. Because it's a, pl- it's a place of insecurity. Um, tremendous insecurity. It's yes. tremendous insecurity because when you meet someone who is, uh, when you meet someone who is comfortable in their own skin, who understands who they are at a deep, deep level, um, nothing faces them. It truly, you know, I've met some, I've met individuals like that where they're so comfortable in their own skin uh, and they understand who they are at such a deep level that you can say anything to them and they just be like, it just, this, it's like, it's like water off the back of a duck. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't even touch. And it's uh, as opposed to someone like, you know, you see something on the, uh, in, in the news where in a 15, I literally saw this in the news the other day, a 15 second argument in a, in a, in a supermarket. Some guy took out a gun and shot the guy and killed him yes. for a 15 second conversation because his ego was so bruised in that 15 seconds that he had to take action and ruined his life and ruined the other person's life, obviously. Mm-hmm. And all the people look all because of, of not feeling comfortable with who they were or even understanding they who are. they were it's actually who, really with who they are. Yeah. Who they are. Exactly. Who they are. And they are right with yeah. their existence. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a scary, it's scary. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little right. scary out there because of, of that. Um, you also talk about in, in the in the book the attitude of harmony. Can you can you dive into that a little bit? One of the issues that we tend to psychologically conf- get confused by is we we tend to label events in our lives, people in our lives, the universe itself as being good or evil, good or bad. And this is a very very childish. Um, very, very simplistic label. Now, there's a reason why we label things. It's to expedite and not have to spend time on something, right? You give, so for, so for example, let's imagine the first time you, you were an infant in your crib and you've never been out of your crib. Somebody picks you up and takes you out the door. Prior to being taken out the door, you may have seen it from your crib but you didn't think of it as a function. You just saw the grain of the wood or what you didn't even know it was wood. But you, you, you saw it's in a sense, it's essence to some degree. Even if it was a low resolution image, you, you're not seeing its function. But as soon as you go through that door, a whole new universe opens up to you and your mind automatically by association creates an embedded story in the nervous system, which says that door is a portal to another universe. Door equals portal. Door is function. So then after that, every time you see a door, you no longer see what you originally saw. You see its function primarily. Right? Mm -hmm. And and that's a shortcut. For for function, the body has to survive. It's trying to save time. If every time you looked at a door, you had to see its like atomic level kind of thing and build up to eventually get to its function, it'd be dead. (laughs) Right. <laughs> before before you went through the door, right? You, you, it would it would be actually uh, ruinous to your life. So these are just like mental shortcuts that that are built into the nervous system. It's software that is sort of self directing software as you develop that you don't even have to think about. It happens naturally. It's instinctive, right? In the same way, this good and bad thing happens. Problem is, it's it leads to a certain amount of disharmony. At some point in the individual's life, not every individual, but what we'll say, what we'll call as awakening individuals, at some point they recognize, however I'm perceiving the world and life, it, it's, it's not satisfactory for me anymore. I've got some, maybe they are familiar with the term shadow work. I've got some shadow stuff there that needs to be dealt with. I need to look at things. I need to reassess my life, right? Some people, they get to 40, 45, and they're like, you know, they, they good. realize they've been living a completely bullshit yeah. life. You get the oh, idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. If you you're the, lucky, if you're lucky at 45. <laughs> right. And, and you may you may just go the cheap route and buy a nice Mercedes or whatever else car you maybe you get a Tesla. Now. I don't know what you'd get now, but 
thinking, hoping that that will save your life and, and cheat on your wife or husband or whatever, you know, right. that, that doesn't really work. Right. It seems enticing, you know, initially, but that doesn't really work. It actually causes more disharmony. So I'm, I'm going to get back to the disharmony question here and harmony and disharmony in a moment. However, some individuals, maybe after they've made a few of those mistakes or possibly before, they recognize that whatever the issue is, is really in here. It's not the things. It's not that I don't have a Mercedes. It's not that I don't have you know, some, you know, young guy, young girl to, to, to fornicate with or whatever. It's, that's really not the issue. The issue is the way I, I perceive myself and the world. There's something amiss there, right? But in order to really make progress, we need to sort of set aside the whole good and bad label thing because it prevents us from seeing the details of reality and ourselves. And so it's, it's actually helpful then to start to look at it in terms of harmony and disharmony, right? Everything is one, but it can express it harmonious way or disharmonious way. And I'm not saying harmony is better than disharmony. It's your preference. It's up to you as an individual. Would you like to actually feel harmony within your body, like through and through? Or would you like to feel this anxiety all the time or depression all the time or feeling of, of smallness where you're stuck in the emotional refractory period for long periods of time? Right. When you but if, you but if you feel smallness in life, it's because you're disconnected. It's because you're disconnected. That's you're right. completely and you're disconnected because of this program that's running that's morally judging everything. Hmm. That's why you feel disconnected. Which goes back to like he who has not thrown he who has not sinned throw the first stone. That's right. Uh, you know, exactly if we go back, right. if we go back to Jesus, thou shalt not judge. It comes and so the Genesis code points this out. There are two fundamental things that need to occur in an individual to awaken to the depth of harmony within them. First is the, the softening of the feeling that you know shit and that what you know is true. Right? So it's like it's going towards maybe I'm not, it's like just sort of not, it's not like it's important that I know that if I pick up this bottle, there's gonna- I have to have this belief that. Right. Whatever's in there is going to, in some way, nourish me. In this case, it's water, and that water is nourishing, and that reaching out with my hand to grab it. But I have to have the belief that that's all possible in order to have a drink. Correct. Right. That's functional knowledge. But there's a whole bunch of beliefs and theories and knowledge that are not so functional or totally dysfunctional that we're holding on. It's just like baggage that weighs you down. And it creates right. a veil of, of, of perception that makes it very difficult for those individuals to actually realize in a sensory, in, in an embodied way, I guess we will say, in an embodied way, the fountain of their being. It's, it's like just this completely like mystical concept to them. We even call it mysticism for that reason. It's not mysticism at all. It's actually the fountain of your being. It's there all the time. It can never not be there. Everything else is just operating sort of like it's like the hardware of your existence or something like that. Everything else yeah. is just layered on top of that, but actually can veil you from perceiving the fountain of your existence. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the programming that we, we pick up along the way. I mean, there's a certain amount of programming that is, I, I, I always tell people like, Oh, you know, I came programmed from the factory that way um, because there are certain innate talents and skill sets that uh, I could do. I can't play basketball at an NBA level, not my thing, you know, but I can, I, you know, I have a way of talking. I can talk to people. I can I have that way. I can do, I can tell stories. There's certain things that I, that fall into my, my toolbox, but as we grow and also that's just our experience through our parents, through our, 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 our um, community, through our countries, through our, ex- our experience, certain programs start to hardwire in, which is like, you know, if, if you ate a banana and every time you touch the banana, you burned yourself, mm-hmm. bananas would be evil to you. That's right. You know, if every time you see a, a banana, you're like, ooh, can't get a banana. You know, people who have, you know, digestive problems, you know, they look at a tomato and go in, but other people go to a tomato and go, oh, I can't wait oh. to have, uh, you know, some pizza, you know, but other people look at pizza like, oh God, I'll die if I eat that. And the same thing, it's all about perception, but this programming that we're built in, you have to understand that you are not your programming. You need to become aware of your actions, aware of your programming, 
and then start when you see certain things happen, sit back, watch, be the watcher of your own life and say, mm-hmm. you know, I don't like that. That's, that's giving me disharmony when yes, I do that. Yes, that's and right. It, that's right. It, it comes down to, ultimately, it comes down to actually what you just prefer in your life. Right. Now, the danger to what to that fact. So let's say if we remove the moral judgment. Sure. I'm not going to call you bad or good. Fucking ring nut ring. I'm sorry. I'm cursing on the show. This is all <laughs> ring good. Nut or, uh, you know, lefty idiot or whatever. What I don't even know what the yeah. terms are anymore. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not going to do that because it doesn't help. I don't like it when people do it to me. So I'm not going to do it to them. Right. Mm-hmm. There, there's so, so then the question starts to be, okay, if we're not going to call things good and bad or good and evil, if we're not going to morally judge life, by what do we base our decisions? How do we make our choices? The answer is for our preferences. And that person will say, well, how, what, how does that not equal moral relativism? Now, so the question is, what is moral relativism? Moral relativism is the belief that you need to have a fixed set of morals, like a societal level of morals, in order for like what's good and bad, in order for us to not go off the rails. Mm-hmm. And so if every individual just did what their preference was, oh, well. it would just be chaos. Mm-hmm. And this is true. Every individual that has a closed ego, if they live their life by their preferences, if everybody did that, it would just be chaos. And we would probably go extinct as a species. And so this idea of moral relativism has killed the idea that you could actually live your life without measuring morally a long time ago. And the reason it killed that philosophically is because people were completely unaware that you can actually consciously be in touch with the source of your being. And if you're in touch with the source of your being, your preferences are no longer small preferences. They're preferences that take into account the large picture. A connectedness. A connectedness. So your preferences are now benevolent in a sense, are harmonious in a sense, and a large scale. They're not just what you want, like a two-year-old who wants the cookie. So in other words, is a true thing in societies of people who have closed egos, but it makes no sense at all when people's egos open up. But right, this is that, a question that philosophy has not addressed because the philosophers themselves may not have been in touch with the essence of their being. And it's really interesting because if you look at primitive um, civilizations, not only in history, but like even currently and today, you go into the Amazon somewhere and there's, you know, there's still native tribes who've been there for, you know, a thousand years or something like that. And they haven't really let the outside world in. They have a, a, they have a sense of connectedness because their survival relies on that connectedness. If they don't work as a unit, as a, as a, as a, as a family, as a, a village, they will die out. They won't survive where we've now gotten in, in the mainland, if you will, we've gotten to a place where technology has made survival, you know, almost a second thought, a secondary thought. Like, you know, we've got how to say that for most people, it's not even on the menu. Right. Housing. Yeah. What's important is getting money to be able to afford all of this technology and all these, these things. That's, that's the concern. But if you notice that just by me saying that, it's like my concern is about getting money to provide a roof over my head, food on my table. They hear the word my a whole lot. That's right. There's nothing that is wrong in that sense, in that sense, as far as you know, we all have to live in the world that we live in. But the the perspective is so different from a tribe like that, where going out to get something for me makes absolute no sense to them. Because if it's just for me, like if I had all the coconuts in the forest, um, what, you would die. I will die because eventually my coconuts will run out. And because I didn't share my coconuts with the entire tribe, the rest of the tribe died and I'm alone and then I die or I'm holding all the coconuts. Some of the other people are like, hey, man, <laughs> I'm going to have to. There's going to be a war <laughs> to your point. And it, ha- it happens a lot quicker than that. I mean, oh, yeah. human being, very few human beings can survive alone. I mean, right. Even if you had all the coconuts. Like even if you had an infinity of coconuts. Yeah. And training and training for survival. All that, all that it's like shit happens. You're going to be injured. And there's going to be a time when you're not going to be able to get up and go to the water hole because you twisted your ankle or broke something or whatever. Someone has to bring you water. Well, you got coconuts. Too many of those will cause diarrhea. <laughs> now you're dehydrating yourself with your coconuts and you're dead. Right. 
And so but that's, but that's again, and we're using this as an example by, by trying to illustrate that if you don't consider the whole, that's right. we will not survive. If we do not consider our neighbors, if we do not consider our, um, our communities, our countries, our, the world at a much deeper level, we will not move forward. I think that's what's going on right now, that there is this complete reshaking, re, recalibration of where we're going as a species that is uncomfortable, just like when you're pump, when you're bench pressing 200 pounds, 300 pounds, mm-hmm. it's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but it's needed in order to grow. And sometimes that's a personal pain, but sometimes it's a societal pain. And I think we're going through not only personal pains, but Both. also societal pains as well. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And as we go through this pain process, much as you described, there's always an opportunity that we start to get tired. And we may become tired. The ego may become tired enough that it goes, I just can't argue with this person anymore. I, I don't want to want to say that anymore. I, I, I just, I just want harmony. I want peace. So I'm going to stop <laughs> adding to the mess. Right now that's maybe You're a right. really small percentage of the individuals, but sure. that is an avenue through which many individuals will probably awaken quote unquote spiritually. Well, it's kind of like what the, you know, what the military does or, or the Navy SEALs do. They'll break a, an individual down. They'll break the ego down to a place physically that it, it's done. It, it can't fight back anymore. It, and that's how military, military training goes. You break in some down so you can become part of the unit. That's right. And that's it's, right. so it's not about individuality. The Rambos of the world don't exist really, you know, inside of, 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 of the military. It's all about the unit. It's about the core. It's about working together because even at the military standpoint, they understand that if it's just a bunch of individuals out there, you're going to lose the battle. So okay. even at that level, you can understand that you have to work together in order to make this happen. Because if you if you fall too far down the rabbit hole of your own self, which obviously social media is a drug and a half about how to just constantly, it's about me, it's about what my beliefs are, what I do. It feeds that. It feeds that we're, it's an addiction at this point. Right. It's crazy. And- and, and what that does now, you talked about in, in order for them to come together, they need a common aim. And that is what people are fighting over right now in the world. We're fighting over what we believe or what should be the highest value. Right. Right. And so you have some that are, will say the individual, will, so this is typically a kind of um, a more modern, like the United States was founded on this idea that the individual, individual. is the nexus of or the most essential point. Right. And so we need to lend power to individuals so they can be motivated in the world. Right. Mm-hmm. Not do as minimal um, hindrance on the individual behavior as possible. Then you have, uh, we'll say, tend to be socialistic or communistic point of view or group think view, like in Japan. They're not communist, but they do have a Confucian idea that everybody should behave the same way. We all, right. Right? You're, you're not, they hammer down the nail that stands out. Yeah. They, st- they stifle, they stifle the individual. individual. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just, yeah. For group harmony. The issue is if, if you look at like a lot of old Japanese movies, you'll see a common theme. Like oftentimes the main character at some point in the movie is standing like on the beach, looking out on the ocean, wishing they could be somewhere else. That's what's right. going on there. <laughs> right. Right. Not because the land is, it's just because it's such an oppressive um, psychic state that they're in. They can't be individualistic. They cannot exercise their individual desires. I mean, that's, that's, what's interesting about uh, samurai, the old samurai movies, you know, the Kurosawa films and seven samurai and uh, those kind of things is that the, in, in, in Japanese lore. And again, you know, more, much more about this than I do uh, that the, the samurai is is an individual, but it is but is based around a moral code of yes. being of service to a uh, to a boss. I forgot the name of it. The, the, to the king, daimyo. To the, king. daimyo exactly. But when he's when that daimyo is left dead, or he wanders the land, his life is pointless. His life is pointless, and he just and that's when the adventure is like a great great setup for a great story. Yes. But generally speaking, samurais 
didn't always stand out, but they did in a sense. They always they were always at a higher, different not higher, different level than someone who didn't have their skill set, didn't know how to work with a sword. Right. But yet it was still in, in, in that culture, still kind of all all samurai would there wasn't like the one insane samurai. <laughs> It's not like the gun. Not like the gun. Insane samurai. There I were. Mean, there there were. Everybody would go. Yeah. There were. There were a couple, but nothing Gods like the, in the in, in the samurai world. But but, yeah. but it's not like the uh, the gunslinger of the West, which is a, 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 it's very similar. Well, I guess I guess what I should point. No, it's very much like that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very much like that. Yeah, yeah. I have what were called Ronin, who did right. not have masters, and their their goal was to become so famous that eventually they'd be hired by some lord for a high position as a retainer, right? right? And so they would go out and have life and death combat with other Ronin individuals, n- non-affiliated samurai essentially, in order to get a name so that they could then get a great job. <laughs> right? that, that was it's just like the Wild West, only with swords. Right. Uh, but the, the key thing is, so if we look at the samurai ethos, the highest value was loyalty. Highest mm-hmm. value, it's, it's a gang mentality essentially. Now, loyalty to the society or loyalty to your feudal lord, mm-hmm. whereas if, if you're in a, a, a gang or whatever, it's not for society. It's for your criminal um, group. Your tribe, your group, your whatever. Yeah, your sure. group that, that may be actually kind of working um, in a way that most of society might not appreciate. Mm-hmm. Right? So, but, but their highest value may be loyalty. For example... If we get to the individual, the highest value may, like in the old West, the frontier spirit, that might have been the highest value in the US at some point. The key point is there are myriad different values that an individual actually has. Some of them are in what we'll call the pole position. Well, one of them is in the pole position during significant portions of your life, but, but they shift around according to the circumstances. And, and not- also age, and also age, just. And age, and age, sure. Yeah. And the key point is the, the, the only highest value that can be in that pole position and not lead to a breakdown of the individual psyche or consciousness under pressure, as well as societal breakdown, is mm-hmm. an embodied sense of clarity. As soon as any other value takes the pole position, takes the highest position, we're going astray from our fundamental nature. All other values are inferior to or should be lower on that hierarchy of values than the embodied clarity. And I don't mean just a reason or logical clarity. I mean, there's this feeling of broadness and openness and very clarity in the body. It's like the inner eye can see all aspects of you without flinching or judging. All aspects of life without flinching or judging. When that's the pole position, you're awake. And when you're awake, so let me ask you. What will it take for us to wake up? Honestly. You know, yeah. Jesus says, know the truth and the truth set you free. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. What that means is honesty, like a deeply embodied on it, not like some external truth that's out there that if I study some book, it'll tell me what the truth is, like an object, but like the actual endeavor to be honest and truthful. In, in, in the depth of your being. That is the truth that one knows that sets them free. Hmm. So I think, and I think right now, there's so many different versions of what honesty is in society, meaning what's honesty, what, what, what's true for me is not true for you and vice versa. And now there's a distortion of the truth. Yes. And so I, again, I'm not talking about anything that's objective. Right. I'm talking about, uh, but about I'm an talk- attitude toward your exploration of life, not Two plus two equals four. Right. But if, if, if there's a truth that it's sincere. So if there's a truth that you believe that, God, I don't even know what it is, but that, you know, if you weigh a thousand pounds, that is completely fine. And I'm just going to, I'm, that's, I'm cool with that. Mm-hmm. That's a truth for you, but that's a truth that we all see that will eventually to your demise. Well, so what's actually happening there in the psyche of the individual is they're justifying something that they even know is unhealthy for them. Right. It could be drinking, ego, it could be smoking. It's the ego that's protecting themselves. So that is not a sincere search for truth. Right. It's, it's, it's like the attitude of truth, truth is not even there. The attitude of honesty is not there. They're painting their mental picture in order to justify whatever it is their way of being or doing. 
So well, yeah, like, it, it, a person it, can weigh a thousand pounds or a hundred pounds. Those are facts. I've met someone who weighed uh, like there's a there's a fighter called Butterbean. Do you know? Who oh, of is? course I know Butterbean. Yeah, he's an amazing puncher. May, uh, yes. Okay. So he's massive, massive and, dude. It's a wall. He's a wall. And he's fat. I mean, he's just giant. He yeah. looks like he's like a sumo wrestler essentially, right? He's huge. He was he was <laughs> so entertaining. And he's such a great personality. Yes. Yes. Yet, you know, and you would think he's got cholesterol off the roof. He's got yeah. high blood pressure. His heart rate is crazy. He's uh-huh. just, a, a, you know, diabetes. Sure, all sure, 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 sure. But they checked him out and he had like perfect blood pressure, perfect heart rate. It was just, it was just, he didn't have high cholesterol. It was just a, a, like a medical miracle, a total exception. For him, that body that makes- style might work, might mm-hmm. be exactly right for him. I don't know. So it's, it's all very, in a sense, we're being honest with our deepest self. That right. is the root. And, and, and I, I don't mean honest in a factual way. I mean honest in like a sincere, deep um, desire to, to, to feel and perceive what is going on within our mind and body without trying to justify it or minimize it or distort it in any way without allowing the ego to play its little magic games, because that's the lie. The truth is that sincere attitude. Right. The lie is the ego's stories. That's the serpent in the garden. Right. And, you know, addicts deal with this all the time. When, you know, like they'll, they'll just constantly tell themselves, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not right. an alcoholic. I'm not addicted right. to this drug or that drug until you see all the destruction around you. And the ego still says, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. Why? Because ego wants Sure. That control, right. um, and it's extremely, um, you know, we are fascinating. Uh, We're fascinating, and the interesting thing is that addicts may be, I think, that almost a perfect example of it. But then you start to ask yourself, what does that mean to be an addict? And then, then that starts to open things up, and you start to realize we're all addicted to all kinds of stuff. Absolutely, the exact same thing that a heroin addict would do. For some of us, it's TV, food. Right? Food, TV, yeah, right. sex, right. Uh, right. work, working out, all of it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so if we look at these addictions and we ask ourselves honestly, what are these addictions actually doing? What are these activities? They're distracting us from something. They're distracting us from something that's makes, making us uncomfortable. That's why we're doing it. It's interesting because the I forgot what philosopher said. He goes, all of man's troubles, it is it's inability to sit in a, in a room by himself quietly. That's right. That's and right. it's such a true, true statement that, you, you know, it's for so many souls around the world, for them to just sit quietly. That's why meditation is very difficult for a lot of people because mm-hmm. it, it, it's just, it's too much. And the ego is like, wait, 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 this is ridiculous. Why are you here? Like, I don't, and it starts fighting back against it. And it, it it took me years before I finally be, was able to, because I tried meditation multiple times in my life and I would do five minutes. I'd be like, why am I here? Well, you know, if you would have told that person, like, did you meditate two, three hours sometimes? Um, it, it would be beyond my comprehension, but it was because the ego was fighting it so badly where now it has no say in it. It's like, I, right. I, I have right. to do it now. It's part of my, my daily practice. But, right. um, but it is true because it's most just, people are you capable of being with yourself without distorting, without distracting, without trying to paint or justify or minimize in any way? Can you actually just perceive and be? That's it. And that's waiting is the easiest thing in the world. And also the most challenging thing you'll ever do. Right. Exactly. Because, because I mean, you are going to do something. Right. And it's not actually the doing that leads to the awakening, so to speak. But you're not going to be able to help but do stuff. I, yeah, call it, the, I call this the woodpecker on a concrete pole phenomenon, uh-huh, which is. Okay. So, so as we start to awaken, so individuals who have gone through the questioning of what they are, it's a very common sort of um, Eastern approach to mm-hmm. like, what is the observer? What, what am I? And that kind of thing. You kind of weed it down. It's a never ending process in a certain way because your mind will keep on pecking at what it thinks you are. And it'll keep pecking and keep asking, keep pecking, 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 pecking. And, and it actually causes a tremendous amount of disharmony oftentimes. It, it can be quite upsetting. 
it's so and, and there's no way of stopping it like it, it is going to continue that would that mind is going to continue to try to define its nature this is what the universe is doing again i talked about that that zero conscious zero and its projection of what it's just mathematically um exploring all potentials of definitions of self and your mind is made from the same thing it, it, it has the same function and so your mind will do the same thing that's not wrong it has to keep pecking until the brain until they tell you get such a headache or until you run out of energy that it goes oh fuck i'm done <laughs> i'm done i don't care i don't know what i am and i admit it and that's the reality i don't know what i am so one thing i do know is that i don't know what i am and so there's this magical catharsis. <laughs> right. And, and then you start to search. You start to search out. You're not searching anymore. Well, no, to a certain extent, like you're not searching anymore, but you, but you start like, at least for me, for my awakening, when I started to question these things, I've always questioned it at certain points in my life, but the ego wouldn't allow too much to go forward. But as I've gotten older, I was able to finally start going and start listening to certain teachings and start mm -hmm. listening to, you know, finding books like your books and other people's books and, and just start listening to different perspectives about the same problem. We're all talking about oh, the same yes. problem. Yeah. We're all talking about the same problem. Was, Jesus was talking about it. Yogananda was talking about it. You're talking about it. We're all, we're all talking about the same problem um, of trying to find this our, is very interesting, and I'm hoping you'll continue with, there's something that, that you're suggesting here, which is I find quite fascinating. So if you could kind of keep going with Okay, it. okay. So, so finding the, going back to finding, the question is, how can I return to source? How can I return okay. to happiness? You're, you're, you're posing the question as a function. Of how can I do X, mm -hmm. right? You're not posing the question is, what am I anymore? Correct. You're absolutely so right. A, so we got to differentiate the two. So we had the original question is, what am I? So or what am what reality or what is truth? Because it's the same question. So if you if, so if you're asking the question, how can I return to what was the question? Again? Source. How source. can I return to source? How can I return to my first thing is you can never be separate from source. You're right. It's impossible. You're right. That is the foundation of being. You have never, ever been not for a single moment of your life ever been separate from the source you just think so <laughs> so then finding so answering the question who am i what am i where that so who and what are different questions so very much so part of this process i talk about in the genesis code the logos mm -hmm. and it requires and it's actually a strenuous practice early on because we are really really not just you and i but just humans in general we're kind of lazy with our words and oftentimes we don't really look at what they mean, not only in a de definitional level, but what they mean on an association level within our subconscious mind. Most of us just don't have the capacity to perceive elements of the subconscious mind. Fair enough. But who and what are very different questions because who now is a persona? Who is an identity? And that is still the default mode network at play. The default me no mode network, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? I'm not. Please, yeah, please elaborate. Okay. So relatively recently, there's been an exploration of meditation and psychedelics. So there's been a lot of research into both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's great that it's happening at this time. Another synchronicity. What they notice is people who have are successful meditators, skilled meditators, can typically meditate to a point where this, this the, uh, an area, a, a number of regions in the brain that are along the central line are active, which we will call the egoic perception, the, the self-identified perception. I am Richard. It's, it's a subject object type relationship or perception that when we meditate to a sufficient depth or take a certain psychedelics to a certain strength, that shuts down. Like blood flow to those areas actually slows down and they quiet. And then suddenly it's like we're dropped into this realm of non-subject object relation. Or that timeless realm, right? Right. And, and so because that's actually a neurological thing that's going on, it's important for us to differentiate who am I from what am I? Who am I is still the default mode network. It's, it's, it's the serpent in the garden posing the question. Mm. 
and it can't lead to a functional answer. What am I is taking us much closer to in the right direction. Now, as we practice the logos, our refinement of language will, will, uh, will make us ever more sensitive to how to formulate a non, what I like to describe as a non-syntax error question. By syntax error, I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that can lead to a viable functional answer as to um, not, you'll never know what you are, but, but it will lead to an exploration that's sort of open versus one that's closed from the outset. If, if the question is, what, who am I? We're kind of closed from the outset. Now, yeah. part of that might be, so we have, we have an issue of language again, um, the true self versus the false self. So there's a, the ego self, that's the identity that's developed through your lifetime from the momentum of the universe that came through to you. That's societal influence, that's genetic influence, that's your experience of life that makes the identity that you have now. You didn't choose it. Right. Many people think they chose it, didn't choose it. It just developed. Fair enough, you're like a three-year-old kid. You, you, <laughs> you don't have this concept of choosing who you are, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a natural development. That thing is simply not capable of making a functional question. And if it asks the question of what am I, who am I, it's referring actually, it's self-referencing. Self-referencing, it, it's, it's the little self asking the little self what the little self is. Right. You, you follow? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And so in a sense, we can't even get the question right until that little self starts to quiet. But even the question isn't, it's not with, even within our reach until that little self quiets then the big self can now ask the question. And its question might be something very different. It probably won't even be, what am I? But the little self will certainly make the, what am I? It'll do, who am I first? Later on, once the who am I is completely destroyed because every answer leads to disharmony, it'll usually go to then, what am I? And then it will ruminate on that for a long, long time, or maybe a lot of very in short, intense spurts, for some individuals who have gone very, very deep into this, at some point that falls away. And then the question is simply, how do I want to live my life in a way that's in harmony with the true nature of my being, which is a conscious zero non-knowingness? How do I live my life fully authentically? because you will never know who or what you are. It's a really fascinating way of looking at it because I always, I always thought of my personal journey as a, a haze. That is <laughs> a complete... Is it purple, is it? Huh? It isn't purple, is it? It wasn't a purple haze. Um, <laughs> a metaphorical uh, haze that we've thrown on to ourselves over the years with our, you know, our programming, our, our life experiences, all that stuff. And, and the ego is very part of that haze. And then as you start to awaken, that haze starts to clear a bit here and clear a bit there and things, you know, what I always, I always find, I think you said it earlier is like when you attach the feeling of when you hear something or you, um, you hear, you read a book, you watch a movie, you go down a path, you hear someone speak um, something if the feeling feels authentic to you, a little bit of that haze starts to wave away. A that's little right. bit of that haze starts to go away. And that's something that has happened to me over the years, um, especially when I started to meditate, where that haze started to clear. Because you, when you meditate, you go into a place where there's no haze. That's so you right. start. So you start realizing, wait a minute, there's another way to play this game in a way. And then you start going, well, wait a minute, how can I bring what I'm – feeling and meditation into the real world. And that's when you start to question. That's when you start to search. When I say searching, I'm searching for answers or thoughts or perspectives that start to clear. This start, start this, to clear. This is it. This is starting to clear the haze a bit to the point where hopefully where some of these yogis and some of these masters like Jesus, like Buddha uh, and these, and, and these, and these masters 
um, they realize that the haze is all gone yes. and they understand the truth of who and what and, and how they are in this existence, in this life. Understand what is interesting. What they understand actually relates exactly to what you just said. Because what you're not on a search now for what you are, who you are. You're actually in a search for how to be authentic. Exactly. To your nature, even if you don't know exactly what your nature is. And you find out, you get hints of it through doing things. Right. Or seeing things and noticing the feeling in the body. There's this feeling of like, oh, that feels so good, so right, so whatever. That's so engaging, so inspiring. It feels so meaningful. Most people are insensitive to that. That's your radar. That's your compass is meaningfulness uh, in, in it, like an embodied sense, like your body is engaged and it feels meaningful. When you're done that activity, you feel like, oh, thank God I did that instead of what did I do with my whole day? What a waste of time, right? right. So we start refining through awareness and embodied awareness, authenticity, mm. And that refinement burns off so much chaff and dead wood until eventually there's nothing left and you just feel light and clear inside. It's, it's a marvelous place to be, but it's, and it's something that is it's not complicated. It just has not been well articulated throughout the ages. Right, exactly. And especially for today's modern world, some of the older texts are difficult to read because I've tried reading some of these older texts. Yes, and- they're, they're, they're difficult. And also, they're oftentimes monastic type. They come from monastic type sources, which mean they do have, these are, these are texts and explorations of people that were living their life in a secluded, kind of idealistic setting. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think that's a terrible setting to do this. I think it's a completely terrible setting because right. it's a judgment against the nature, natural flow of reality. Right. If you're off in a, in a mountain somewhere, and, naturally. yeah, if you're off in, in a mountain somewhere in some, some in monastery, nothing against that. But if you live your entire life in that perfection of like, there's no this, I can meditate for 10 hours. Like, no wife, no children, no school, no, none of these I always take responsibilities for. I always say, you know, Jesus found enlightenment because he didn't have kids. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, I'd look throughout, throughout, like even in actually, the, I think he had a lot of kids. Most of his disciples behaved like children. <laughs> it's very much so. But no, it was so funny because there's, uh, I go, I, I, you know, I've studied a lot of the the yogi masters over the years, and I always found uh, Lahiri Mahashai um, one of the most fascinating yogis because he had children, because mm-hmm. he was the only one I've been able to find because most don't they choose not to have children to go on their spiritual quests because it's a lot harder to go to spiritual quests with kids because you know and a wife and or or a husband i would suggest i would suggest that that is an assumed mindset fair enough we've been inheriting that forever my way towards awakening has been under pressure this is why the samurai art is so helpful to me agreed because my teacher was going easy on me or creating an ideal environment but actually being intense with me trying to find my weaknesses and that's what actually greatly expedites things. So, but we can't even, we can't even begin to, to expose ourselves to that type of training until we start to make some attitudinal adjustments. Right. And that's what I've learned in my time with trying to find my own path. My own spiritual path is having a family, having those real world pressures. That is my, oh, obviously it's my path because I'm, I'm, I'm walking it. (laughs) Yeah. And I am, I'm not I'm not getting rid of my children anytime soon. <laughs> so um <laughs> so that pressure of living in life is such a better representation of what because you can read a, a book on a, on a yogi who was in the Himalayas and you're like that's great dude. Um but and I love their concepts but it's hard to try to put that into this in today's world. It so just I, doesn't, it doesn't it, fit. It, it it's doesn't hard. It's Concepts fit, you know, on a, on a on a you know maybe on a spiritual level, maybe on an intellectual level, but then you start you know things start to throw yeah, off. The embodiment seems impossible. It's tough and because I, yeah, because you're like, oh well, I can't do this or I can't do that, which are limitations you're putting upon yeah. yourself. Well, the, their activities are actually tuned to a monastic lifestyle. So correct, you try to take those same activities which were tuned to a very specific way of being, specific way of living without kids and without women and without temptation and all of that. And you try to put them into the, the normal world. 
it kind of just doesn't fit. It's tough. It, 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 it's tough. Certain concepts obviously can, can come through, but it's difficult to do all of it. So I always found that fascinating. That's why I love reading about Lahir Mahasha, who had kids, mm-hmm. he had a wife, um, and, and he was an accountant prior to his finding his path. Mm-hmm. So it was like, oh, this guy wasn't like just born and all of a sudden was enlightened. It took him a minute to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that a lot of people, and please, please, I'd love to hear your thoughts too, is like, you know, Jesus wasn't born and just showed up at 30, like, or 31, however old he was. Like there was years that are unaccounted for. And I would argue that probably during that year, he was finding his way. He was going through his trials. He was, he was educating himself. He was, you know, there's, there's many texts, Indian texts that talk about Jesus over there and meditating and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's, I know that's blasphemy for so many no, it's, people, it's interesting but it's true. because where he lived was right on the trade route between <laughs> the East and the way it was like the main roads for, so you almost, you couldn't live there without being exposed. We, we tend to think that they would only have Jew, Jews at that time would only have been exposed to Judaism. No, that's not true. They right. would have been exposed to all kinds of different um, religious ideas, spiritual ideas. Right. Exactly. And but I uh, through there all the time. It's a trade route. So I, I, I imagine they got in the East to get these ideas. Right. Yeah. And, and look, Buddha did the same thing. Buddha had to go through his trials before he figured out his totally path. Natural. Totally natural. No one just shows up enlightened. That's not part of this experience. That is not part of why we're here. <laughs> I'm not sure. No one, maybe, I don't know, but, but maybe one pretty strongly that that's not that, that, that most people are not going to show up that way. <laughs> most people, I'm not sure if anybody, but I haven't, I haven't seen anywhere in my journeys and my history, my, my studies that I found someone who just like was literally born and was enlightened. There could be. Yeah. The, yeah, yes. was born I'm open to that possibility. I too have yet to, to I've yet to see it. Person. Is it possible? Sure. Yeah. But generally speaking throughout history that I've studied in my, yeah. in my studies and in yours, generally there is a process. We are here because we are going through a process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some are here to go through an enlightening process. Some are here just to learn certain lessons and continuing that enlightening process. Some find enlightenment in this, in this, in this time. And there are many yogis, there are many masters who have done that throughout history and it's been recorded and so on, Jesus being one of them. Um, but we are here to learn. We're here in a process. So I just always, even when I was a kid, I'm like, he just showed up at 30. Like, yeah, that's like, fun. you know, like what happened? Like where interesting stuff wasn't recorded. <laughs> like, you know what? There has to be some record of, you know, he didn't just show up and he's like, all right, I'm good now. And, and like the, there was no explanation of his journey because that shows um, that show that, that doesn't go with the narrative that those people writing back then wanted. Like you were saying, you're, you're an antichrist you're an antichrist you're an antichrist. Well, because yes. it, it, it did. almost all of that was happening in Greece. All the, all of the, all, all of the um, original texts that we have, these were not Jews writing it. Right. Right. These were, Greeks writing it. So it had already been far removed from the culture in which it was born in. And if you think of Jesus' disciples, including Jesus, he was a, a mason. They say it, people tend to think he was a, a carpenter. But if you look at all of his um, all of his references to building, it's always with stone. Yeah. yeah. He was probably a mason. Right. Mm-hmm. Where do Freemasons come from? <laughs> they recognize that Jesus was probably a Mason. That's why they call themselves Freemasons. Right. Right. So there's a lot of things that we misunderstand from that time. Sure. Even now, and, and, and even people then misunderstood because different cultures, Christianity spread outside of, of Judea. Sure. Outside of the Jewish concepts. Now, there were some Jewish groups as well, but we don't really have access to that information now. Right. The only access we have is primarily Gnosticism and, and forms of Christianity, and they all didn't agree with each other. And the most important thing is that Jesus, as a Mason, probably couldn't read. Mm. Almost nobody could read in those, those days besides the, the, uh, the church elders. Sure, of course. The priests and, and the clergy. All of yeah. students, they couldn't write. They weren't writing this stuff down. The greatest teachings Jesus ever gave. No one was writing it down. That's the reality. And that's a hard thing for people who believe in Christianity to swallow. But I think that if they actually just accept that first, 
that will be the beginning of their true Christianity. Well, just, I mean, just, you know, just look at, I mean, the Crusades weren't very Christian. No. <laughs> most, I mean, I mean, I mean we can most go on. People, what they've done is they've justified the things they want to do by the religion that they follow in defense of Christ. Now, it's interesting. They call Christian apologists apologists. That doesn't mean apologies like, I'm sorry. It means in defense of. Right. In defense of Jesus. That's what it means. In defense of Christ, actually, Christian apologists, it means, in, does Christ, that which is connected to the root of being, need your defense? <laughs> and are you arrogant enough to think that you understand the nature of Christ sufficiently to know how to defend it properly? There's a tremendous arrogance that's going on here. Hmm. Now, the interesting thing is, if you talk to Christian scholars, and if you talk to those who went to, um, what do you call the school that you go to, uh, it just slipped my mind for... Oh. Um, Pre, like pre, preschool? <laughs> <laughs> priest school. You mean priest, you mean preschool? That's a technical term, preschool. Yeah. Um, they are exposed to this information. They just don't give it to their flocks. Like they're they know they have to study these scholarly things. Preschool. So they themselves actually the priests and the 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 reverends and stuff, they know what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. They share this with people because they don't believe the ordinary person is smart enough or capable of dealing with reality. It's a it's a it's it's a condescending point of view. Yeah, without without uh, and, question. And this is why, and we still have this problem now. Our leaders do the same thing. They don't tell us the truth. We're not right. capable of handling the truth, so we don't trust them. Same things happen with Christianity, but this has happened with every religion. Yeah, pretty much. And so, so this brings us back to, if it's all right, this brings us back to the fundamental problem of society, which does come down to the individual, and groups of individuals, but it comes down to attitude. We tend to think, the ego tends to think, if we just formulate the government, create the right punishments, if we have the right kind of economy, that will straighten people out and all will go well. But that's not true. Because if we don't trust ourselves on a deep fundamental level, if we're continuing to morally judge ourselves and others, which we're doing all the time, we're constantly measuring our worth. Mm -hmm. I'm worthy of love. I'm not worthy of love. That equation is going on constantly in the subconscious mind for people and then projecting it out onto other people. So long as that's happening, there isn't a community. There isn't trust. There isn't communion. No matter what laws you make, the system will collapse given time. This isn't an issue of, should we be communist? Should we be socialist? Should we be capitalist? So the, the questions that people are asking, should we believe in religion or should we be secular, right? Should we be atheist? All those questions that the philosophers are asking, you, you'll, you'll typically, you'll hear, and I love both of these individuals I'm going to mention, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, they have different ideas on this. But they're asking the wrong questions, as brilliant as they are. They're asking the wrong questions. Because it comes down to is a deep wellspring of trust for being. And if you have that, great. Without that, no matter what society you develop, it will collapse. The timer is starts the moment you, you put your flag up. Some, some forms of government and some types of laws will allow it to last, to last longer than others. But absent communion with your, your own body and the essence of your being, nothing will actually work. And there's no getting around that. And so we have to mature as human beings if we want to survive as human beings. Now, maybe we don't want to mature. or Maybe we don't have to survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that conscious zero we talked about, the face of God, it's continuing whether there are human beings or not. Oh, the planet will continue with us without us. The planet us. will continue. Other forms of life are going through the exploration. Human beings are just really interesting because we're essentially... We're, we're, we're mobile earth. That's all we are. There's nothing here that's not the earth. Right. We are the earth literally exploring itself in ways that a lot of other animals can't explore itself. God, I never really, that's a fascinating perspective. I've never thought about that, but we are, you're absolutely a we're mobile earth. We're actually literally just earth. Yeah, we're carbon-based. It's star matter. And star yeah. matter, you know, there is no disconnect from, from the universe. We are the universe exploring itself. We come from it and we go back to it. We've never left it. 
No, physically. I'm thinking like the, 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 physically the carbon. Physically as well. Yeah. Yeah, so even like, now, this is still the universe. We don't come from, it's not like we leave it. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, I understand. I understand. But like, you know, but it you, emerges. We emerge. We emerge from the earth and we go and back we, and we go back to the earth. And, and we, and yes, and we, what, do you, what would you call, what would be a good word for that? We emerge and then my descend, descend, Dis, <laughs> dissipate, dissipate, dissipate back in, back into the overall form. Yeah. In, this is all that's happening. Yeah. And, and, that, and that, we've been so, it, what I'm saying is so simple, but you never hear anybody talk about it. You're right. And you can't look at it any other way. If you're being really honest, you cannot look at it in any other way. We are just emergences of the earth exploring itself. This is the big bag of molecules. How do molecules become intelligent and conscious? Maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe they're inherently so. Intelligence develops, consciousness always is. That's something we, is worth exploring. We've started out just like by default saying, no, it's all matter and it's not conscious. And somehow magically for human beings, consciousness emerged, but not for any other animals. Right. And as we're exploring other animals, we start to realize, wait a minute, the great apes seem to be conscious. Elephants seem to be conscious. Dolphins seem to be conscious. Wait, wait, wait. Magpies and crows. At a dip, but at a different crows. level. But at a different level. Well, yeah, it's, it's it's we're talking about intelligence here. That's the key point. Is we need to separate out intelligence from consciousness. consciousness. Oh no, because break those two out, then things are easier. More yeah, I mean, you, yeah. You look at you look at elephants. They feel they they they. You know, you you've seen some of the, I've seen some of those documentaries, and you see like they they stay three or four days with their dead mother who just died, yeah, and they sure. because and they cry and they feel, yeah. and dolphins do as well, and and obviously the great apes. Uh, do as well. It's fascinating. It, it is a different sense of consciousness, but there there is a consciousness there of some. There is. If you look at, if you've ever looked an ape in the eyes, you can't tell me that there's not something looking back at you. Some people will tell you that. You know, like there's there's. I won't tell you that, but there no, are no, no. Oh, of that course. Like, no, that's just an automaton. Well, of course, exactly. But if you look at, you look truly. I mean, look. I mean, look at um. Oh, uh, God, uh, Fossey's work and, um, and, uh, Jane Goodall's work mm -hmm. with, 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 uh, with chimps. Oh, I mean, yeah. I we're mean, so similar to them. Oh my God. You can't, you can't look at that research and it's scientific research that she's done yeah, over if, if you decades. Mean, if you're, if you don't have some strong bias, of course, can't look at it without admitting yeah, it's all likelihood they're conscious. Like we are just different uh, and different, a different, different filters. Uh, I mean, they have. So it's interesting, um, since we're, we're really, what we're really asking about is our senses. Mm. So how do I say this in a way that, that is as clear as possible? And this is going to get, in a, will seem very esoteric, but I suspect at some point in the not too distant future, this will just be like obvious. Most scientists will just admit this is true. What are the four forces of what we call reality? Do you know them? I do not. I don't mean to put you on the spot. So we've, I got, we've got the strong force. These are atomic forces, the weak force. These, this is what holds electro, you know, um, atoms and, and, and um, atoms together. Then we have electromagnetism and gravity. Right. Part of what blinds us to what those actually are is we think of them as forces. Again, as if they're unconscious. But I, I, what I would add to it is that they are actually senses as well. But these are senses that an atom that's missing an electron or, or any um, any um, particle feels a kind of anxiety. It wants to be harmonious hmm. and it's going to try to attract to it that which is going to fulfill its nature. Hmm. It's a sense. And when it receives all the particles necessary for it to be at harmony, there's a cathartic release. This is consciousness. That's how I see it. That, that all other senses build, simply build on top of those four primary senses. That's all that's going on. And the first sense is just the awareness of I am slash I'm not. The awareness of perception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The next senses are those four foundational senses of 
we'll call physicality, upon which then we develop further senses, life forms, for example, the ability to smell, hear, detect electromagnetism or whatever else, all the different senses that we have. Intelligence in itself is a kind of sense, right? Not every animal has the same rational sense that a human being has. They have other senses that they're far stronger at than mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. Now, we being very arrogant, biased creatures tend to think that our way of perception, our senses are superior to all the rest because it allows us to dominate things. But those other animals might be around millions of years long past when we go extinct. Sometimes being the most dominant is actually a losing strategy. You're like, well, look at the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, although that was not necessarily a case of their own failure, like an asteroid hit the Earth. But no, no, no. We're likely to press a button and nuke ourselves. Right. <laughs> right. That's a failure of a sense. That's intelligence gone astray or gone awry as a result of being disconnected from the fountain or foundation of being, from the primary sense, which is of existence slash non-existence, the conscious zero. Is this making sense? It makes all the sense in the world. Absolutely. I mean, it's what you're saying is the connection to being, I, I would also consider that connection to your higher self. Is that a, is that a I fair? Would, it's actually your lowest self. It's the, the common denominator. We call it the highest self because when we touch in with it, we feel so much lighter and better. There's an up feeling to it. But actually, it's at the foundation, it's the denominator. It's I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's 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 so the reason semantics. I'm very specific with words is because essentially what's happening is your mind creates a geometry of thought, and mm -hmm. the the thoughts that are out of sync with the geometry of being lead astray, and our words help to correct the thinking. Very to much me, so. this entire system is mathematical. Mm -hmm. It's all based off of positive and negatives that are mediated by a zero. That are always balanced out by a conscious zero, which means our 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 psyche is also geometric and our thoughts are geometric now of course it takes a hell of a lot of embodiment to get to a point where one can perceive what i'm talking about and it's not some just like some woo woo idea mm -hmm. but the way we get back the way we recognize this is by becoming very precise with our language and that takes a lot of training in itself like not training in, in that someone necessarily teaches you what to say but like bodily awareness as you speak, you can feel when something's not quite awry, not quite correct. You can, you know, when you're telling a lie. It's, it's interesting too, because when I, you know, people always ask me in my, in my side of the world in the, in the film industry, they're always like, what, what is that thing? What am I going to, how am I going to make it? How am I going to pop out? How am I going to do this? And I go, the biggest thing for you to succeed in your endeavors, artistic or others, is to be authentic with yes. yourself. Yes. To be, and that is something that most most writers and screenwriters and and filmmakers and artists that's what blocks them. But the ones who succeed, you start going through all the grades. They are authentic to who they are, whether you like it or not. That authenticity is what we are attracted to, not the BS, not this, this, not the, not the, what we think it is. It's the authenticity. And that's what we, that's called honesty. That's so, honest. It, it comes back to the, the truth that sets you free. That's what it is. Yeah. What it, it is, this attitude of just revealing, it's a revelation of your essential nature. Right. Good and bad and ugly and all of it. People who, who just like you said, who write or like playwrights or, or, or screenwriters, but, but novelists and whatnot, my books as well. And nonfiction doesn't matter if you get a sense that that person is somehow kind of skirting things and not, you can say, and you can sense it and you can sense it of their being it's a turnoff. I mean, we want to be taken to the edge emotionally, physically, psychically, like psychically. I mean, like the psyche. Yeah. yeah. Why else would you read a book? Right. And that's why. And when you watch a film, sometimes you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, that was just that was made for the money or there wasn't a oh, connection. Yeah, and there was those. <laughs> yeah, there's too many of those. You're right. But when you see something that has an honesty to it, an authenticity, uh, authenticity. And you know what? And I always use this example. In 94, there was a movie that came out 
that I went to the theater with my high school buddies. I was already out of, I was already in college, but I went with my high school buddies who were all knuckleheads. I was a knucklehead, you know, it was still in the state of, you know, that John Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal were the greatest actors of all time. I was in that stage of my career. <laughs> true that, true that. <laughs> no offense, guys. Um, <laughs> but at that time, and there was a movie that I watched in the theater and I saw it and it cut through even all of that ignorance and ego and everything. It connected with me at such a deep level that I, even my friends were like, wow, that affected me. And they were knuckleheads and full of ego and full of bravado. And this movie cut through all of it. And it was the Shawshank Redemption. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That, that movie, it is so pure. In it it's just right into the depth of emotion and being. Oh, my it's God. So like, you can't, I, I, you know, anytime I feel bad, like if I release something and someone gives me a bad review, I'll just type in bad review Shawshank Redemption. And I just start laughing at people who gave Shawshank Redemption bad reviews because they obviously weren't, they didn't get it. Yeah. But that I wonder movie, you, since you're so versed in, in, in the film industry. Sure. Is, can you give an example? Because see Shawshank Redemption, I, I don't remember who directed it. That would be Frank Darabont. Okay. So he also wrote it based on a Stephen King short film. Yes. And he had, a short a lot story. Of money, he had a lot of money backing him because Ooh. he had, he had, he had some star, stellar actors in there. Quote, quote, unquote, big money. That, that movie was probably made for 10 to $15 million back in the nineties. Oh yeah. That wasn't a Tony, Tim Robbins was a star, but he wasn't a, he wasn't a mega star. Um, Morgan Freeman was definitely not a mega star at that time. No, he wasn't. He was not Morgan Freeman yet. He was, he was, he, okay. So I'm, I'm like looking at it in a retrospective. Oh, absolutely. Like now you're like Tim Robbins, yeah, Tim Robbins and, 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 and Morgan Freeman, but no, in 94, you guys, everyone could go back. They were stars, but they weren't who they weren't like, they're not Tom. They weren't top. Do you have an example? Uh, Because people will still say, yeah, it was a star power that made it. That, that oh, argument. sure. I got one. You have an example of a movie that was low budget that didn't have any sure. known stars in it sure. is just like that, that hit it big and just hits, hits, hits the viewers deeply. Um, hit big. And OK, so look, I'll tell you like what. That's something that people would know. OK, so I was going to say Wings of Desire because that just hits you at a level that uh, you can't even comprehend. But it wasn't a big hit because it was a French. It was a foreign film. But okay. uh, a movie like. Big Fat Greek Wedding. Big what? Big Fat Greek Wedding. Oh, I've not seen it. I mean, every, I mean, there was one of the, notes right now. So the big, a Big Fat Greek Wedding is a comedy, but the writer, Nina Vola, I forgot, I can never pronounce her name. She was a Greek, uh, she's Greek because the whole movie is about her Greek experience. That movie is so authentic, so authentic to the experience of family. Because mm. everything in the movie was her experience having a Greek growing up as a Greek family and all oh, the wow. nuances of, of oh, that it, and it's, it's such a great, it's a fantastic film. That was a no budget movie with no stars in it. And it is the biggest, one of the biggest independent films of all time still is one of the biggest independent films. It made like two, $300 million. Wow. Um, but it doesn't, you don't always have to be serious and be authentic. The authenticity in big fat Greek wedding connected with the world because of its authentic look at family, because mm. we all have, if you're Italian, if you're really Cuban, do. if you're Chinese, like we all have crazy families and the, the characters and the nuances and the things like that connect. So we all projected ourselves into that movie. So when you watch it, you'll see, oh, that's my mom. That's my dad. That is my experience. Because the, but, but the thing was authenticity. Yes. Because people remember- tried to, re- people tried to remake that in many other Oh, try to read. Oh, of course, like when you see a movie like Pulp Fiction, how many ripoffs of Pulp oh, Fiction yeah, were yeah, there? That's true. They try to rip it off a million times. Money. Yeah, sure. But no one can reconnect the way she did because it was an authentic thing that only she she was the only person on the in the world who could bring that movie to to the masses. It was her story and her story only. Do you, for for me personally? Do you remember the movie? Uh, it was actually originally a, a, a like a novella by Stephen King called Stand by Me. Of course. Who directed that? That would be Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner. Okay. Now he was probably popular at that time. The actors, of course, no, no one really knew. Well, there were nobodies. They were all kids. Yeah. They were all kids. Yeah. They were all kids. Right. Um, but, but that, were, that one really hit me. <gasps> like, I could watch that endlessly. 
but the that's thing like is, almost exactly my childhood. That's how I grew up. Well, the thing is that that movie specifically, Rob Reiner was not a big director yet. Yes. He okay. was not, he was not, he was known as Meathead from uh, All in the Family. He's, okay. he, he's the actor who played Meathead and, and All in the Family. So he was still trying to. Okay. So this movie would fit into what we're looking for. Yeah. It was a studio movie, but again, we're talking about 80s. So the movie was probably in the seven, eight, nine, ten million dollar world, which is basically an independent film <laughs> in, yeah. in, the, in the studio world. But that was a small movie, but it had Stephen King behind it. But yeah. it wasn't your normal Stephen King film. It wasn't a horror movie. So it wasn't something that they can really hang their hat on. that ring with the same kind of authenticity that you're talking about? Oh, absolutely. Because you could there's a because it was authentic to Stephen King. Yes. And then the authenticity that Stephen King brought it into the story, the screenwriter took it to the next level. And then Rob Reiner understood it very clearly and brought yeah. his authenticity to it. And then the actors brought their authenticity, even though they don't they didn't have that existence because they were kids but they were authentic to the characters of who they were playing. But it all started with Steven. It all started with Stephen King. So when you start going throughout cin- cinematic history, you start analyzing hits and non-hits. You know, you look at a movie like The Matrix, which I talk about a lot on the show. Um, that was as authentic to the Wazarskis who directed and wrote it as anything that they've, they've never been able to re honestly, they've oh, never yeah. been able to yeah, reconnect right. with it. Right. They've that's tried right. a million sequels times. Have never been they're nowhere near the first. So no, they're, you know, I, I enjoyed the second one. The third one, I didn't like the fourth one was, eh. um, but the first one, the fourth one yet. So. It's okay. It's fine. But um, Come on, watch it. The first one was good enough. <laughs> the first one is one of those stories that shook the world. The movie, the, the world changed after that movie. Because oh, yeah. it started to question reality. It's so the first time in a mass way that we all started to question it, whether you're questioning if it were a simulation, whether you question, but you started to ask different questions after that film. And it was hidden in this beautiful action packed visual effects extravaganza. So it was able to hit the masses, you know, um, someone like, um, oh God, uh, James Cameron. So James Cameron, who's one of the most famous directors in history, one of the most successful directors in history, made Avatar and Titanic and so on. He made a sequel to Aliens. Oh, so yes. If you, so Aliens, the reason why people look back at that. So movie, the first one was Alien. and then Alien. Was Alien. Right, exactly. First one was directed by Ridley Scott, who's a master. Okay. The yes. second one was a, a young director who had just made a movie called Terminator, yes. who really he was still trying to figure himself out as far as not figure himself out, but other people needed to figure him out. Sure. But the way he approached that story was unlike a, a normal way you would approach a story. You, sure. He approached it in the way of this is a story about two mothers protecting their young. Yes. Yes. And that changed the intent, but that's enough. That makes it real. We can relate to that. And that's why there's aliens, there's action. There's, but at the end of the day, it's a story about a mother protecting their child. Right. And right. from the alien queen point of view, they, she was protecting her children. And from her point of view, she was protecting Newt, which is the adopted daughter that she got along the way. Right. That authenticity into story, we were able to connect to because it was something so, and again, from his perspective, if you notice throughout his entire filmography, it's full of strong women. Mm-hmm. It's all, oh yes, yes, that's right, that's right. All his films. All of them have strong. That's women. even that's including the abyss, the abyss, true lies. Yes. Um, Titanic, all the terminators, all, they, all the yeah, term yeah. strong women at the core. That is something that's authentic to him because he was raised by a strong woman. Mm. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I mean? So these are oh, things yeah. that yeah. this is authenticity and it doesn't have to be like the extreme of big fat Greek wedding, which is like literally my experience but aspects of you, the truth that you are thrown through your art, thrown through mm-hmm. what you're doing. But you and truly you, feel. The and that's, what, and that's what people connect to. Yes, Sp- that's right. Steven Spielberg, you connect to E.T. Because Steven Spielberg looked up in the sky with his father and wondered about aliens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. It was a and, real feeling for him. And for him, and that is why you connect to his, that film. There are other films that he's made that you might not connect to, um, but there are. But this, but this specific, the, 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 that specific film, you were able to connect to. So, like you know, and we could. Oh, it's interesting uh, because you have you now have the screenwriter, like you said. There's many layers. Are you okay with time? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, fine, fine. 
So you have the screenwriter. So you, you've got the maybe whatever the original story is, if it was a book or whatnot, I don't know. Right. But then you've got to run through the, the, the screenwriter who then has to get approval by the producer and the director. And it gets rewritten many, many times. Mm-hmm. has to go through the actors and proper sets. And even the space that it's in has to feel authentic. Each actor in it has to feel the awe of the universe. If we're talking about um, Close Encounters, for example, or, or else it won't come through. It's such an incredible collaboration, potentially, of what we're talking about is authenticity, the truth that sets you free mm-hmm. in a completely falsified world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we don't care. If, we're not really talking about objective reality. We're really talking about the reality of feeling. Mm-hmm. That's the truth that sets you free. And Richard- the authenticity to that is the way forward. And that's what people don't, people want to think it's meditating on a mountain, saying so many ohms or doing this, that, or the other thing, following this certain tenets. But all of that is tertiary stuff. Most of it can just be burned up and tossed out. Mm -hmm. If you, if you are living to the depth of your inner reality, and I don't mean your beliefs, I mean, exactly love you have for your child Mm -hmm. or your parent or the awe you felt when looking at the universe or mm-hmm. the 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 undescribable drive to become a director or whatever your passion why you have that passion you may not even know program right. programmed at the factory sorry <laughs> program <clears throat> programmed at the factory <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but unless you explore those things you are going to be miserable I absolutely I agree with you 100%. Uh, Richard man, I I I, f- I love talking to you. It is such a great we always we always have such fascinating conversations. This one's um definitely one of those very fascinating conversations. We went everywhere. We talked about so many different big questions and um it has been an absolute pleasure. Can you tell people where they can pick up uh your new book The Genesis Code? So the Genesis Code. I, I never even asked you. Did you have a chance to read the whole thing or not? I not mean, the whole thing. I was. It, I was dense it's, reading. It's a pretty. It's pretty dense. So you start reading, you're just like, okay, I gotta digest. Okay, it I gotta has, digest. It's better to take it slow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's bite, bite, bite on that one. You can't eat the whole elephant at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's real. It's really deep. It's not that it's complicated. You know, like it's not like I use big words too much. No, 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 no. It's about the the, the concepts. You read it and you're like. I got to sit down and think about it. You it's going to it. make you reframe. If you're being honest, it'll, it'll reframe the way you see just about everything, not only of Genesis, but nature of reality in yourself. And you will only know if it works if you actually apply it. Correct. And what it summarizes too is authenticity. <laughs> now, where can people, now, where can people get it? Oh, so this is available. Yeah. A- any online, uh, so yeah. Any online store, for example, whatnot, you can find it on Amazon. Most people would probably get it from there, but. Mm-hmm. Barnes and Noble or whatnot, yeah. Um, Great. Case, I think I'm not even sure how many bookstores are open. <laughs> there's a there's a couple. There's a couple there's left. A couple. I still, there's a couple left. And then where can people find out more about your work? Richard L. Height, H A I G H T dot com. I have uh, a lot of of videos on YouTube as well. Right now, I'm going through what I call the trust experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, real uh, real briefly, I've uh, about three years ago. I was diagnosed with uh, impending paralysis, Mm -hmm. run over by a horse. Um, And there's, there's, there's no solution for this particular problem. Rheumatoid arthritis is growing into the nerves, cutting them off. So eventually I would lose my arms. And after that, I, I, I did some meditation and my body gave me a solution. I applied it. It went away for three years. It's come back. Mm -hmm. But now my body's telling me something very, very different. And it's called the trust experiment, which is to actually go into the paralysis, not try to fight it. And this is going to challenge, like my students don't want to see that happen. Who would want to see that happen? But actually like the depth of my being, I need to go into this Mm -hmm. fully with the attitude that that's just where my body, like if I close my eyes and meditate, it's like my body is just completely turned into trust. And I need to explore paralysis. And that's not wrong. It feels like right on every level. But so I'm talking about, I've got six or seven videos up talking about this process. If you watch them, you'll start to notice like really obviously where you don't trust yourself. And that's Mm. important to know. 
whether you go through the kind of trial I'm going through right now or not, it's irrelevant because you'll have lots of other areas in your life where trust for yourself will be challenged. And I don't mean your egoic self. I mean, like your, the depth of your being will be challenged. And most of us don't notice when we just, dis- when we turn our backs on that, that our depth of being. But for those who are on the awakening path, you might find that those videos very helpful. And I'm going to invite you to join the trust experiment to the degree that you can. I, I, Richard, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate the time. This has been a fantastic conversation. You are welcome anytime back on the show because uh, we always have, I mean, we ended last class conversation with the Wally Coyote and, uh, <laughs> and the Roadrunner. And this one, we went down the path of movies and, and, and finding the truth in yourself. So I, I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you for all the hard work you're doing out there and, and, uh, and trying to help people around the world. So I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, Alex. Anytime. I'd love to talk with you.